Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Um, we'd like to welcome political cartoonist and uh, satirist uh, John Slade um, to this conversation. We just finished watching your beautiful film. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, we also want to say thank you to uh, Antenna for co-sponsoring this event. And uh, after this, you can go visit the Antenna page to purchase a, a full kind of anthology. I think it's six six episodes or six... Um... Yeah, six episodes of the Afro Brother Spaceman. The tome is entitled uh, The Adventures of the Afro Brother Spaceman. The Known Adventures of the Afro Brother Spaceman. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So if you liked what you saw and you want more, you can visit antenna.works and go pick that up. So, John, tell us a little bit about yourself. How how did you get into um, making political cartoons and, and uh, you know, uh, what are some of I your- I liked cartoons as a child. Simple as that. I like cartoons. I like the art. I was a weirdo aesthetically. Remember how everybody colors in coloring books? They do those thick lines on the outside, then they do it light on the inside, which I never figured out. So I would go for opaqueness. I would try to make them as dark and solid as possible. And some child asked me, why are you doing that? I was eight, eight years old. I said, it's cartoon color. And they thought I was nuts. So I always liked cartoons. I got proficient enough to know what production house made the cartoon. I could tell the difference between Jay Ward and Hanna-Barbera. Filmation, De Pathé and Freeling, all the cartoons and who made them because I would read the names. So I was strange. Like it wasn't just Disney. Most kids knew Disney made cartoons. They had no idea. So I just had a good time doing that. And I remember a lot of cartoons from back in the day because I don't mind telling you I'm 63 years old. So I remember cartoons when I was seven, six, five, you know, before they even had Saturday morning cartoons as a real thing. Oh, wow. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, you got to thank the Beatles for Saturday morning cartoons. 1965, they put the Beatles cartoon on. Cheaply made, horrible thing. Mm. You know, uh, absolutely uh, ghastly. But it was such a hit. ABC was making bank on Saturday morning in the children's hour. So all the other networks said, oh, hell no. We got to get on that. So thank the Beatles for Saturday morning cartoons and that crazy little cartoon they made. By Ranklin Bass. That was the name of the people who made that. <laughs> oh, that's dope. What I'm going to do right now, John, is share a bit of your uh, yes. work so people can see it. And um, they can find this at 504.com, correct? Think504.com. Think504.com. It's a newspaper of the Internet filled with interesting news and, and insights. And I have been um, working with them for about two years now. Uh, under the publisher, um, Jeff Thomas. So okay. those are my cartoons. I, uh, oh yes, the, <laughs> that one, that was kind of, I had that, I asked uh, Jeff, Jeff, you think this is too soon? He said, nah, we're going to go with it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's so funny. Can you, can you talk about a little bit about like how you use humor um, with these cartoons because they're hilarious, you know? I mean, and they, they're talking about really serious issues here, but also you use- This one is coming. This is gonna hit New Orleans because things are just rough right now. Uh, I almost got involved with, okay, I'm gonna have my mortgage. I'm gonna stall that, I'm work. Then I decided, no, I think I'll just suffer and pay that like a junkie mm -hmm. having to pay his supplier because a lot of people <laughs> are gonna get stuck and they're gonna want that money practically all at once. Like, you know, we let you go for a year, but man, you know, you know how it is, bro. I need, I, you know, the money or your house. And I'm afraid that's going to happen to a lot of people. So that's something on the Biden administration that's going to happen. And I'm kind of worried about that. So I, I drew a cartoon of the uh, tsunami of foreclosures, uh, spe specifically for New Orleans East. Mm. That's going to be rough because a lot of people have lost money in this pandemic. You just can't, you know, not have people work and not make sure all their needs are taken care of. We should be paid like uh, agribusiness. Pay us not to grow tomatoes, to keep the thing going. Right. So that, that's where that came from. And that's kind of a local thing. And of course- uh, uh, What about this one? Oh, well, that one has to do with January 6th, <laughs> where 
the Trump rioters, and that's what they were, the Trump rioters, seditionists, Mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted to hang Mike Pence. So now it's not enough to be Republican and, you know, be ambivalent or hateful towards black people. You've got to really be. It's like Nazi Germany. It's not enough to just discriminate against gays. You got to really knuckle down and help us with this Holocaust thing they're going to talk about in 70 years. You got to really, that's, that's pretty much. So now there's a civil war in the um, uh, Republican Party. And I did it with uh, Frankenstein because that's, everybody knows Frankenstein, even if you haven't seen the James Whale movie, particularly even Bride of Frankenstein, which is a great movie. Anyway, I use that because they built this thing since 1964. People don't realize this goes back of whenever you get into an argument with a Republican and say, well, we helped with civil rights, but you never took a victory lap. You never ran on over and over again that you liberated black people. You never did that. You knew what you were doing when you looked at. George Wallace in 1968 and go, hmm, you know what you were doing when you saw the southern states go for Barry Goldwater back then? Hmm. So, yeah, they've been um, they've been looking at things that make them go, hmm, before Arsenio came out. So this is the result of all that. This is the apex. You know, um, you built Cyberdyne and now the machines are coming to kill you. I love it. I love it. So, again, if you want to see John's work, it's think504.com. I had a ball looking through your cartoons. I think they're great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jess. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you could talk talk to us a little bit about what went into, like, back to Afro Brother Spaceman, because those are two different things, right? You make political cartoons, and then you have this whole different project. Um, okay. Collect- when I was doing... Afro Brothers Spaceman started in the spring before Katrina. Mm-hmm. I was a partner doing poetry souls long before Ms. Gorman took it to another level. And it was with a young lady named Revelation. And we had this place at the uh, neighborhood gallery. It used to be my hangout. I've been in the fine art. I've had shows and galleries. I just had one in Octavia during the election uh, season. And I came up with this idea because there's going to be a spoken word piece of these back in the day before VCRs, you could buy cartoons. The best you could get from Disney was a cartoon record with the voices or Yogi Bear from Hanna-Barbera with the voices. So you play it, you listen to your voices when you were a child. That was the only way you could experience the Flintstones and all that stuff outside of when it came on. Back in the day, if you missed the show, you just missed the show. There was no DVR or nothing. You just had to wait till next week and hope they rerun the episode you missed because you might not even see that again. Anyway, I was going to do a satire of a children's record of these mythical Saturday morning cartoon characters, the Afro Brother Spaceman. Well, Katrina hits and I won't get into that. It was a disaster. Anyway, when I got back to it, it was at a thing called 24 hour comic book day where you had to make a comic book in 24 hours. So I said, I got this script, so I'll make these characters. I got to do nine pieces of art, the cover and eight pages, but I had to use half the time to figure out what they look like. So the sketches that I made are pretty much the way they look now, with a little more refinement. You know, Bugs Bunny in 1941 did not look like Bugs Bunny now. Hmm. So they are the same. I created them and I wanted to do something science fictional. So I put this thing together and I, okay, I finished this issue. I finished the first big issue. Then I uh, made another one. Then I started building the the universe and giving the people the two, there's Darnell dash dark star. He's the captain. He's the first name. The women only had one name, Denara. Okay, and Cosmere. Mm. So about a third issue, I had to give them last names. So it's Cosmere Cosmos. She's the starry-eyed, hyper-intelligent, Spock-like sister. And I got Denara, who came from, you know, the hood. Mm. So she's kind of rough. Her name is Denara Atom Jack. Why are you doing that? Because that's the title. of That's what they call lifting a rocket or a payload in the orbit using atomic bombs to boost them through the atmosphere. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, so that's Atom Jack. So I called her Atom Jack. So basically, Darnell is the, the square. 
he's the boy scout. You know, he's perfectly, he knows about stuff, but he doesn't, he's just square. You know, he intellectually may understand hip hop, but he can't really get into it. He's right, strictly okay. square. <laughs> uh, Denaris, the roughneck, and Cosmere Cosmos is, again, the Spock sister. So I had these two people, all these people had to get together. So I'm kind of like being Star Trek for, you know, the black experience. Mm-hmm. These different yeah. people combine forces and they don't mess with each other. They mm-hmm. respect each other. So, and yes, there's no hanky panky. It's strictly professional, even though he's a male and he's got two uh, 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 second and third in command women to help him. And they're in a top secret base on a HBCU somewhere hidden. Nobody knows which school it is. <laughs> you know, even the very students never quite seen the rocket blasting off from the stadium. So it's all top secret. And one of the funny things I had when I had to set a uh, uh, film festival in uh, Los Angeles, the people who saw it again online, like we're doing, were arguing over what school is it? Is it Tuskegee? <laughs> is it Tougaloo? Is it Gramlin? Where is this place? <laughs> so, See, I thought I, it was Dillard. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> okay. I've okay. asked the characters. They won't spill it. <laughs> <laughs> No, you don't know who it is. Is it Dillard? Mm. You know, <laughs> That's try right. to, they don't know if I'm throwing you off. Maybe right, there's a right. stadium. Maybe there's not a stadium. Right. Well, I don't know. So I, I, it's like that. So, and the sitting president is the only one who activates them. There's mm-hmm. nuclear weapon activation and you activate the Afro brother spaceman wing. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Afro is an acronym. Okay. okay. It's an acronym. Uh, let's see. Uh, aerial nautical flight and rescue operations. Okay. okay. Cool. Now that goes all the way back. See, if you get the book, you'll find that they went back in time to see the Afro brother sky men. Okay. Mm-hmm. And for, uh, it, it too is an acronym, you know, uh, aerial fighter reconnaissance uh, operations. Okay. That was the name. So amazingly, they got these things and the acronym is Afro long before the Afro hairstyle. So now this fits, mm-hmm. you know, uh, <laughs> Kennedy didn't bother changing his too much money on stationery. So they left it alone, <laughs> you know. So I, I go backward through time with them. There's a time travel story. Uh, I riff on Astro Boy. You know, I went to the anime roots like, OK, Astro Boy is one of the first anime. So I invented a black boy robot Mm. who was made by this woman whose name is I Patty. So she's the brilliant scientist that came up with the Chitlin circuit, which (laughs) is the basis of the Afro brother spaceman's fabulous technology that nobody else has. Oh, beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) So I always got to caution people. It's not Afrofuturism. Right. It's contemporary. It happens now. Mm. So that means uh, the first one I did, Bush was president through Obama and the cartoon has Trump Mm -hmm. that they have to cajole into releasing them to go find out what's going on. That is so cool. It's a parody of what they called it. uh, All the pundits called it. Will the norms hold? Will the institutions hold? So that's a satire of that question. Can they get him to let them go save the world? Because he's reluctant because they look like Obama voters to him. Mm. And they had to call him. Usually the president calls them. So it's the first time in the history of the universe they've had to call the president to talk him in (laughs) to maybe letting him go out. Wow. Right. Because that president was a lot. (laughs) So we just have to. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know, and the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was I think what's so cool about what you're doing is the imagination that you put into it, you know, um, and the details. And for 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 black people to see themselves in kind of these positions like astronauts and scientists and and I mean, just everybody, even the villains are black. It's like a whole black world. (laughs) Oh, well, you saw the cartoon. Yes. yes. In the cartoon. If you read. read... (laughs) Say the Fantastic Four, where they meet 
Galactus. Mm. He's drawn white. Mm -hmm. Why is it assumed if he lives in space that with all the radiation that he's going to be white looking? (laughs) You kind of know that Thanos skews white. He's default white. Mm. He doesn't look black, doesn't have thick lips. They could have pruned him up and made him look like a purple brother, but Mm. they didn't. So it always skews white. Space Ghost. I used to watch Space Ghost, not the Coast to Coast, but the original cartoon series. All the villains were white. He, unless they were uh, 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 insectoids or uh, uh, creature looking things or little midget men with hideous ears and faces, but all of them were white. Everybody was white in that universe. You know, you had the presumed black people lived on Earth when Space Ghost was stopping Metallus's rocket from blowing the planet up. You just had when they zoom in on Earth. Oh, I guess that's me somewhere in uh, North America. Okay, (laughs) you had to really stretch. (laughs) To figure things out, you know, mm. um, I, 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 and that's where I did like, OK, it's as if I were making those things. And the style of cartoon art that I used in the thing is kind of like what cartoons look like in early television. Transmission was not that good. It was strictly merely amazing. And it took them every time they make a new generation of television, they'd fix the picture. They'd advertise the pictures better than ever before. You know, and then color came in. Our color is better than ever before. It wasn't until the 80s they started. Well, you know, the thing sounds horrible. You know, the stereo, a Miami Vice in stereo. We never had stereo. Nobody had stereo. You had to hook that <laughs> thing up, even the autofile. But that was the first time they started worrying about sound. Because for decades, we don't care about sound. Get this picture going. And the early Flintstones, I always tell people, look at the first 1960 Flintstone. And 1960 is the last year of the 1950s. It does not start the 60s. And you see thick lines around Fred and Barney. And the backgrounds are simply drawn. Once color got better, they started using thinner lines around the characters. They didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. So as television transmission improved, cartoon characters didn't have to have thick lines. So they didn't have to look like test patterns. So they could do that better. You could always tell that. And it was really quick, like from 1960 to 1966. You know, Space Ghost had thin lines, excellent post, uh, posture and anatomy. Because mm-hmm. the people at Hannibal Barra had to practically learn how to draw human beings. They never had to for a long time. When they did Johnny Quest, they suffered at that. And I suffer, too, because I really have to slow down to draw any character, any time that has actual proportions and realism. And I go, oh, this is so hard. Whereas I could draw my Afro brother spaceman, (laughs) three fingers, one thumb, you know, now I got to draw four fingers and it's got to look realistic. So it's, it's, it's different. It's just different in many respects. So yeah, my cartoon is a throwback to early television animation. That is amazing. Tell us about the process because you wrote, directed, and produced the, the film. How yeah, long did it take I, you to- I, I did all the managerial stuff. Okay. okay. You look at the credits. I had people helping me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Caesar Meadows, uh, did the uh, actual animation. I'd ship him some drawings. Here, okay. <laughs> here's the separate drawings. He'd put them in the computer. Uh, Adobe, uh, Final Cut Pro, all that stuff. And then we had, garage band for the sound to do that Mm -hmm. uh and he was very instrumental in that Uh, it took us three years to do it but the joke still lands that's why i wrote it because i know it's going to be forever before people see it so the jokes have to land years after i wrote them and (laughs) um he did that i had uh uh kenny harrison helped me with a few things coloring i picked the palette Mm -hmm. i picked the palette uh, we had uh, Tom LeBlanc, who just looked at everything and gave me some tips and just said, this is great. I don't know what you got me here for, but this is great. I like it. Cool. Because um, everybody wanted to be involved. And I had Samantha Boye do the voice of Denara Adam Jack. She's the one that's very, very racially conscious mm-hmm. also. So I, I played on that, too. <laughs> um, and uh, I had... Um, a songstress in New Orleans sing the song and do the scat, you know, um, jazz muffin. Okay. Uh, Yeah. The jazz muffin. She came out and did that for me. And, uh, it it was really good. Her name is Iverson. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And uh, she did that for me because I knew her, I knew her for a long time. She when I used to be on WBOK, she came on the radio one time. I said, I like you. I'm a have you do a song for my cartoon one day. She said, okay. <laughs> and she came out and did that. I had a art teacher from Xavier, Mapo Kennard. And she did the voice of Cosmere Cosmos. She was perfect. Oh, wow. And I did all the other voices. I did every other voice, you know, including the villain, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the cosmic, the, was that the, uh, uh, the, my sister, God rest her soul. She was a dashiki diva. This is very important. Mm. I got her to do the voice of the cosmic door papa. Oh, yes. Right <laughs> after she did the voice for that cartoon. So she has not seen it. That's why it's dedicated to her. Mm. She worked with Dashiki Theater forever and as well as Anthony Beans. But she's known as being a Dashiki diva. She did Colored Girls back in 1979. That was the Star Wars of Dashiki Theater. And she was the lady in brown who did the Toussaint L. Overture uh, bit in that uh, choreo poem, as it was called then. So, so she, she died right after, oh. like January. So I had her voice. I said, oh, my God, okay. So she plays that voice. And, and, and I did all the other voices, you know. You know, like um, Big Chief Andromeda. All the Hanna-Barbera villains, you know. Space ghost, you will be destroyed. <laughs> Birdman, you will not defeat me. You know, and of course, they did Galactus for the Fantastic Four cartoon, that same company, back in 1967. That's how old I am. You know, I am Galactus. You will all have your life force taken. You know, so I, I just borrowed from all the stuff that I remembered. You know, uh, I all the voices, including Darnell, uh, all the guys, including the guy that, oh, not again, you know. Oh, my, right, the coffee guy. That's my Speed Racer voice. <laughs> you know. Hmm, it's Speed Racer. We'll have to watch him closely, huh? Hmm. <laughs> so that's how they used to talk when they would dub those things. So I borrowed that. Every cartoon thing I can think of, I borrow from. You know, uh, and 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 it's just, it's just been a, a ride. So I have spent... Roughly about 14, 15 years with the Afro Brothers Spacemen. When I was doing them heavily, I wasn't doing cartoons. I would put all my energies into making those uh, uh, comic books. You know, so I had a title. I had a run. And then I put it together in the uh, big book so everybody can look at all of them. And, of course, that's that antenna. And it's reasonably priced. That's right. I I'm go, I'm I don't know who's watching, but I'm going to head out and buy it right now as soon as we get off the phone. <laughs> because I think honestly, John, this is so creative. Um, you are a gem in New Orleans, and and obviously across the nation. And uh, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. And do you have You're anything, quite well. Do you have anything up next for us that we should be paying attention to? Ah, uh, I don't know. I'm dabbling with something right now. Okay. Uh, I'm dabbling with something, uh, sort of an anti Star Trek. Uh -huh. Yeah, everybody lives in the future, but it's not harmonious. Mm -hmm. They're like strict laws and things and concepts about how laws in space will work. For instance, if you develop a faster than light drive, that can be construed as developing a mass destruction weapon, you know, so that's not allowed. And the penalty is too terrible to contemplate. Ooh. So that's kind of like it is. And it's a different type of everybody living in space, but it's not Star Trek. Right. It's a dy dystopia. <laughs> mm -mm. Not dystopia. Not dystopia. No, no. It's just the philosophy is utterly anti-ethical to what you've grown up watching Star Trek. Okay. Well, that's exciting. We look forward to it, John. Thank you so Whenever much. Whenever I get it done, I don't know. Everything's in topsy-turvy. I mean, I can't come see the movie. I don't have an audience to hear the laughter. I've only had two live presentations at Antenna for the sneak preview. Mm -hmm. And I unveiled it at the um, uh, African-American Film Festival here in New Orleans. Right. You know, right. you know, with G. Uh, so uh, from the pass it on guy, you know, 
So I, 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 it's just been rough, and I'm so disappointed that I cannot come see it. You know, you know, can't put y'all can't even put it outside like uh, New Orleans <laughs> Film Festival did. They had a thing set up on the Greenway. I know, I know. We're gonna we're gonna figure it out, John. Maybe we'll have a special <laughs> screening for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking with you, Jazz. Thank you.